Hi, everyone. Welcome to our workshop with Luis Serrano. I'm very excited for this. And if you don't know what community is, we're an organization that is striving to teach and connect people around the world in quantum computing. And what we host workshops like this all the time. And one of us, our guests is Luis. So Luis, go ahead and introduce yourself and then you can get started with your presentation. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to speak here. It's uh, such a nice group. And uh, yeah, thank you for for joining us at this time. Um, let me just start sharing my screen because I start talking there. Um, do you all see my slides? So if I start presenting. Yes, we can see it. Wait, just let me make sure I... All right, so I have my uh, chat here. So first of all, I'd like to say I, li I like um, I like uh, dialogue more than 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 uh, my own monologue. So I'd love to um, hear what what people's thoughts are, what what questions are, and this is this is more of a discussion. So feel free to put something in the chat or ask any questions. So if, unmute yourself if, if if that's okay with it. Um, and. Uh, you know, ask any questions, point any directions. If we end up going in a completely different direction than, than planned, then that's fantastic. So I, I got a bunch of things prepared. Uh, yeah, so my name is Luis Serrano and I work at Zapata Computing, which is a quantum computing uh, company. And I work on the machine learning, quantum machine learning uh, part as a, as a researcher. Let me see, can I pass slides? Yeah. Uh, first, let me tell you a bit of what I'm going to tell you today. Uh, there's there's more here than what will happen, but I'm going to tell you what quantum computing is. I see some of your probably no, knowledge uh, have a lot of knowledge there. Uh, others are beginners, so this this talk is for beginners. But I'm going to try to cover everything needed in the way I, that I that I like to see it. The same the same thing with machine learning. You don't need to know any machine learning for today, but I'm going to teach you an idea of what generative machine learning is. And if we put them together, we get quantum generative machine learning. Uh, I, there is a coding lab, but I will not go over it. But uh, this is actually part of a, a long workshop that we normally give. Uh, but I will give you the link in case you want to play with it. And I will also give you a link to a demo of, of the product that my company does, which is Orchestra, which is a, a platform in which you can uh, deploy workflows on a quantum computer and or on simulators. So I'll, I'll give you a demo. and and links to workshops and stuff like that for that. So yeah, so as I was saying when, in Zapata Computing, what, what we do is have that, have a platform for for people and companies to use quantum computers, right? Mostly business and 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 research. Uh, so a bit about myself, I started in, in mathematics. I did my PhD in math and was doing research there. And then I, uh, I went into some companies in Silicon Valley to do um, to do machine learning. And then I later in life I decided to to join the quantum revolution. So I've been working on on that lately. Um, I have a I have a YouTube channel if you want to see some videos of talks and things like that. And also have a book called Rocking Machine Learning, which I have a um, discount code that I'll give it to you at the at the end of this talk. So anyway, why why quantum? And I think this is a group where I don't need to sell quantum computing or quantum machine learning, but in the same way that if you go through Wikipedia and all the pages. If you click on a random links, you get to the page for philosophy. All the industries are pretty much leaning to quantum and they're, they're figuring out that um, what AI was a few years ago, which is if you didn't get into AI, you're uh, dead in the water. The same thing will happen with, uh, with quantum for pretty much any industry uh, because you can use it as a tool for, for data, for, for pretty much anything you do in a, in a classical computer. And what you would do is you, you run it in the cloud, right? You, you, and um, you can you won't not like you know purchase a quantum computer, but you can have services where you can run it uh, in the cloud, and it offers just a lot of a lot of better improvements, like not just in speed. Normally, people think it's uh, it's just uh, faster computers, but you actually have better models, and we'll see a little bit of, of that later. 
So first, let me tell you what machine, what generative machine learning is. And first of all, what is, what is machine learning, right? So this is how I like to see, uh, first of all, supervised machine learning, right? I imagine that the model is just like a very smart robot and you have data, data set, right? And so what supervised machine learning does is it tries to answer questions. So for example, the question would be, uh, if you, you know, if you give it this data set and tell it that these things are dogs and these things are cats, then what is this new image that I've put right here, right? This new image. And the computer looks at the data set, comes up with an idea in its mind of what a dog and a cat is and answers that's a dog. So that's the simplest machine learning tasks. It's answering questions. Uh, and that's uh, supervised machine learning. Then there's also Uh, that I with the word describing it, and the computer is supposed to guess that word. Now, um, you have um, no words. You just have a bunch of images, right? So your data is not labeled, and the computer will not know what thing is what because you're not telling it what thing is what. In the distributions or things like that, and it will be able to say, you know what? I don't know what these things are, but all the ones on here are the same. All the ones over here in this corner are the same. And, and so on. So it's a little more meta because it doesn't just answer questions. It sort of tries to understand data, right? It's a little more high level. And then there's generative machine learning, which is a part of, of supervised machine learning, of, of unsupervised machine learning, where uh, you can paint, uh, where you can, uh, for example, do the opposite, right? Instead you tell it, um, you, you, instead of giving it an image and saying, draw a dog for me, you give it a dog and it says, you know, this is, this is the drawing of it. So I don't know if people have seen this page. It's called, uh, which face is real. Have you guys seen this, this page? Can you help me on the chat to tell me one of these images is generated by a computer and the other one is uh, a real, a real person. Uh, yeah, it's like this person doesn't exist. Which one? Uh, which one is the real one here? Help me out. The left is real. Left, right, right, left, fake. Both are fake, right? So I I just loaded this page, so this is new. But I think it's the one in the right because the computer can draw faces, but fingers are are hard. So I'm gonna go with it was the one on the right. Um, and we can keep going, right? Let's do one more. Le right or left? Uh, I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with right. I think people are going with left and right. Actually, no. I think I'm gonna go with left because those glasses are hard to draw. Is it left? Ah! <gasps> I got it wrong. Okay. Well, so you realize how good how good computers are for uh for drawing these things, right? Um. So this is generative machine learning. And I'm going to tell you in a nutshell how it works. Um, it works like you have a data set, right? Let's say I have a data set of images of dogs, and I want some model to draw it. So I throw in, the, and I'm going to show you that this can be done in classical land and also in quantum land. Um, so the way it works is you, you train this, this model. You have a bunch of random numbers, and you put them through your neural network or something. Imagine. If you don't know what a neural network is, imagine just a bunch of math operations that you do in the numbers. And the numbers give you the pixels of an image, and then you compare that with, with your data set, and you say, OK, you know what? That wasn't very good. So I'm going to try to update my, my numbers in the equations to get something that looks a lot like a dog. And the same thing happens in quantum, a quantum neural network. Just uh, instead of numbers, it just has qubits, and it operates on these qubits and get something out. And in the same way, it, it compares if what it got looks like the data set. And of course, at the beginning, it won't. But it starts sort of adjusting the parameters until, until it gets something that looks like the data set. Now, obviously, quantum computers are not big enough to generate images. But they, in, in this talk, I'm going to show you how to use quantum computers to generate just, just smaller, smaller data sets 
and uh and in general that's one one direction that we're going uh in in quantum computers in, in generative models now why are we not going for the easy stuff right like we're not going for supervised learning for like answering questions like linear regression and the reason is that those things are done very well by by uh classical computers and we want something that is hard for classical computers and these problems are hard for, for classical computers so there may be some some hope for quantum advantage uh so yeah as i mentioned uh, a classical generative model you you operate in numbers uh by uh, by adding multiplying doing activation functions and in a quantum general model you operate in, on qubits so you rotate them entanglement and, and and i'll tell you more about each one of these things uh so some some classical models are for example generative versus generative adversarial networks which are the ones that draw those those faces restricted Boltzmann machine very national to encoders etc and for quantum general models we have quantum general adversarial networks quantum Boltzmann machines and quantum circuit board machines. So this is the one that I'll show you today. We're gonna learn how to do a, how to build a quantum circuit born machine. Uh, stop me if there's any questions so far. So let me tell you uh, what is quantum computing. So let's start. Let's start with a qubit. And uh, so the way the way I see it uh, is a classical computer is basically a bunch of switches, right? It's just a bunch of one zero which is it can be one or zero right so you have two states you have zero or one on or off and with many of those you operate with them and you can do any algorithm you want a quantum com computer is more complicated right because switches are not on or off they're more like they can be on but they can be off but they can be like that switch that that you have in the kitchen where it's like a slider where you can put it on on or off but also like an you know a romantic in the middle or something so you have, um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so you can have uh, a combination of zero and one, right? You can have uh, sort of half zero, half one, half on, half off, but you can also have like more on than off and more off than on, right? You can have pretty much everything in between. And uh, so the way we're gonna see them is by saying, you know what, you can have all of it on or maybe 75% on, 25% off, half, half, et cetera. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and answer questions. Do we currently have a capable quantum computer to run a quantum general model? Uh, yes, we do for small, for, for small uh, data sets for of small images, but there's ways to actually enhance generative models by plugging in a quantum computer in, a, in, in the part of a generative model that, that uses little qubits. So like the, like the few, few, few bits, like, like for example, the latent space or something. So it is possible to improve classical general models with quantum computers. Question from Nina, do you need to understand quantum physics to understand quantum computing? Well, I understand very little quantum physics <laughs> and, and with that little amount, I can sort of go my, uh, make my way around quantum computing. So I guess you need some very basic understanding, but that's what I'm giving you today. So as I said, so qubits, are any kind of superposition between zero and one, right? But actually it's more complicated than this. You don't just have every superposition between zero and one, you have more. Because for example, the 50-50, it can be, uh, so if the, if the on, if the, if the zero is an arrow points up and the one is an arrow that points down, you can have arrows that point in both directions, right? You can have your 50-50 can be to the right or to the left. And in the same way, your 75, 25 can be arrows in this direction and so on. So in reality, what you have is uh, more of a sphere. And for the ones on the left, you, you imagine if you didn't have 50, 50, but you had 50 and minus 50. So you're allowed negative numbers. So qubits are more complicated than just, than just a slider. It's actually more of a circle, right? You have every combination to the right and, and, and the same combination to the left. So you can have negative 25% uh, of the blue arrow if you want it, that's completely okay. And there's even more. Actually, qubits can point in any direction. So imagine if this was a sphere, you can actually have qubits pointing there. You can have them pointing there, 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 there. And as people uh, correctly, uh, correctly says, it's a, it's a block sphere. 
uh, yes, so you can actually have qubits pointing in all directions. And that's called the block sphere. Um, I'm going to go ahead and answer questions on the, on, as I go. Christopher says, the actual uh, quantum data difficult to maintain with qubits. Uh, yes, it is, hard to, it is hard to encode data in qubits because there's not that many qubits, but there are ways that you can do this. So for now, small data sets, but for um, as quantum computers get bigger and bigger, we can encode bigger data sets. Anyway, so as I was saying, a qubit is like a sphere, right? Every point in the sphere is gain. And so you can have the on. Imagine if the switches in your house were not on and off and they were in a slider, but they were a complete sphere and you can put the sphere in any position that you want. Now, if you put the, the point in the spheres on top, you have fully one, a full, a full, a full, um, a full, a full uh, up, then you can have a full down, but you can have anything in between. Okay. Uh, actually, I kind of lied to you. It's not, it's not 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.25. There are square roots there for some reason. Uh, but if you want to forget about the square roots, put some green glasses and you won't, you won't see them, but the square roots are always there. So there are times where I will mention them and times where I will kind of forget them conveniently. So let's have a quiz for you. If the qubit on the right is root five, five, and the one left is root five minus root five, what do you think is this one over here? Help me out. Hi, exactly. Christopher's right, says, and Victor as well, and uh, Claudia, and a lot of people are correct. This is Square, this is uh, the imaginary number, right? Square root of 0.5 and i square root of 0.5. So in reality, we're gonna have complex numbers. So every qubit is a pair of complex numbers, except that for some technicality, uh, we can scale them so that the first one is real. Because in reality, if I multiply the top and the, the both by the same number, I get the same qubit up to a phase transition, which is not important. And so I can make sure that the, the one on top is always, always a real number. These four qubits are the exact same thing because of the global phase. So we're not gonna worry. And instead, I'm just gonna never really talk about complex numbers here. But if you wanna imagine them that they're there, they, they, uh, they will be there the whole time. So we have what's called a wave function, right? I can explain my combination of qubits as square root of, uh, of how much zero I have plus square root of how much one I have. So just as a little summary, I can represent the qubit as a point in the block sphere, as an arrow, as a vector, which is kind of how much of up I have and how much of down I have, and also as a wave function. So this is the one for half half and so on. Is it clear for everybody? Feel free to stop me if there's any questions. I see that we have quite an expert crowd from the questions that I'm getting. So I, I'll go a little faster, but feel free to stop me if, if anything. So here are the special qubits. We have the zero, which is pointing up, the one that's pointing down, the one that points right and points left are called plus and minus. These are the perfect superposition states. And so in summary, if your classical is switches are on and off, your uh, quantum is just a point in the sphere. So now here's the thing. Uh, a switch carries one bit of information, a one or a zero, but a qubit carries a ton of information, right? You have basically any pair of complex numbers. Uh, and so you can store the entire Wikipedia there, right? So what's, what's the catch? Like, can I, can I store as much as I want in a qubit? And the answer is yes, but when you look at it, it goes nuts. You, you lose all that information. Uh, since I am uh, switching topics, let me answer some questions. If I miss a question, feel free to ask it again because sometimes it just goes out of the chat. Alexander says, why does QML have a realistic application in the industry? What's the barrier or the problem that has not been resolved yet? Quantum computers are not big enough. If they were bigger, we could do anything we want. Right now, the applications are, are limited because they just not enough qubits for that. Uh, Yash says, 
Don't the error rates cause any hindrance while using quantum computing and machine learning? Yes, error rates are a problem, uh, but you know that's why quantum computers need error correction, which is kind of like use a lot more qubits for a small thing and have a lot of repetition for, for error correction. Yeah, one Nail says block sphere is only limited to two qubits. Uh, it's actually just for one qubit. Uh, as a few people answered. And Yash yeah, says, don't the error rates? Oh, that's the same question. Thank you. All right. So, um, okay. So we got a measurement. And what happens with measurement is that if I have a um, qubit in superposition, then the moment I look at it, it either goes up or down with uh, the probability. I guess here would be 50 50. Uh, but it depends on how much I have, uh, on how much the wave equation is. If my wave equation is 97% up and 3% down, then with 97% probability when I observe it, it's going to go up or it's going to go down. And uh, I'm just going to skip over a little bit since people seem to, to know this. Uh, observations. So, so yeah, when I, when I observe something, basically imagine that the qubit just kind of makes up its mind and two things could happen that the qubit goes up or the qubit goes down and the probabilities are given by the wave equation. Okay. So I imagine it as like, if you put two magnets and one of them catches the, the qubit. So this is how quantum circuits work, right? You go, you, you pass your, your qubit and observe it. It goes in one direction. And it goes like that. So we're going to have a lot of quantum circuits in this in this talk, where where qubits go from from left to right and they get uh, operated in gates. Just going to keep going. So quantum gates. How do quantum gates work? The way they work. Well, the classical gates are the ones we know, like and or not, etc. In particular, not just kind of flips the qubit, right? From zero one from one to zero. Whereas the quantum gates do exactly the same, except they just turn the sphere around. So they rotate the sphere all the way down or rotate it back up. Uh, then we have the quantum rotation gates, which are the ones that rotate the sphere. There's three ways to rotate the sphere, right? Through the x-axis, the y, and the z. And you can use any angle you want. So the x, the rx gate rotates the sphere an angle of theta over the x-axis. The ry gate rotates at some angle over the y-axis, and the same thing with the z-axis. So we have three quantum gates. If you like to think of them as matrices, these are the matrices. Uh, and by that, I mean that if your qubit, uh, if you apply, for example, this the middle matrix for, for pi over 2, you get this matrix, 0, 1, 1, 0, which you multiply by a qubit, you get another qubit, which is going from zero, to from the zero to the one. Then there's the Hadamard gate, which what it does is it kind of oscillates between the four most popular qubits. It sends zero to plus, plus to one, one to minus, and minus all the way back to zero. So the formula for this one, the matrix is one over root two, uh, one, one, one minus one. So as you can see, it sends the up to the one on the right. So if you want to go to the this link in, on your own time, feel free to check it out. And I have some. There are some coding labs where we um, where you can do uh, some. We can draw your circuits and uh, kind of play with them. One, the first one is a model a coin toss. The second one does entanglement and so on. I'm gonna go ahead and answer a couple of questions here. What is the classical analogy of quantum error correction? That's a good question. I would say that it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of coding theory where you can like encode a qubit into something a lot bigger where the, where the qubits are just a lot farther from each other. So it's harder to make mistakes. It could be something like that. Like you repeat your data a lot. And, and so if, if there are some mistakes, you, you have a lot of redundancy. Uh, can we say that all gates are rotations on the block sphere, says Claudia? Uh, the single gates, I believe they are all rotations in the block sphere. Yeah, the entangling gates are not. Uh, 
Okay. So yeah, the first lab has a rotation of a qubit to simulate a coin toss. Let me talk a little bit about entanglement. Okay, so the way entanglement works, in some way, this is not the, the, the exact essence of it, but in some way, imagine that two people have break a, a, one of those bones that give you luck. And uh, I, I get one half and you get the other half, and then I go to a different galaxy. And I don't know what you have, but the moment I look at mine, uh, if I know that I have the, the small one, then I know that you have the big one, right? So this is sort of entangled information. Um, so the way I like to see entanglement is, let's say you have two people and each one of them can be happy or sad with a 50% probability. So how, if they don't know each other and they have no influence on each other, what's the probability that both of them are happy? Well, it's 25%, right? Because it's 50 times 50. 50. Thank you very Thank much, you very much. For, for those ones. I hear my echo. Can somebody unmute, uh, can somebody mute themselves? Thank you very much. Yes, Victor answered correctly, it's 25%. Um, so for happy, sad, and sad, happy, and sad, sad, the probabilities are all 25%. And, but what if I told you that these two people, let's say they're happily married. And so if one of them is happy, then the other one is also happy. And if one of them is sad and the other one is also sad. So if I ask the first person if they're happy, uh, then I know, and they say they're happy, then I know the second person is happy. So all of a sudden we don't have four possibilities. We have two possibilities and they're not 25, 25, 25, 25. They're 50, 0, 0, 50. So those two people are entangled. And so quantum particles are entangled when this kind of thing happens, right? If I have two particles and each one of them is in the superposition state half half, then there's four possibilities for the two particles. It's up, up, down, down, up, down, and down, up. And they all have 25% probability. But now imagine if the following happened when I observe one of them and it's up, the other one automatically goes up. That means that we don't have 25, 25, 25, 25. We have 50, 0, 0, 50. And so we have this case where it's entangled and that's called the Bell state. Okay. Uh, let me give you a small quiz. Uh, if, uh, if my two people don't know each other and they are, the first one is happy 70% of the time and sad 30% of the time. And the second one is happy 60% of the time and sad 40% of the time. What's the priority that they're both happy? Help me out with the, in the chat. Yes, they're independent. They don't know each other. They've never met. Exactly, Yevo Nile says 0.7 times 0.6, which is 0.42, correct. And these are the probabilities for how happy and sad they are. Thank you very much. Victor actually answered all of them. Um, because I have basically my, my qubits, I have the tensor product and the tensor product is just basically multiply the two, the, the, all, the, all the probabilities, right? All the, and this can be done with conflict numbers and negative numbers, but let's just, I kind of hide them, but that's the idea. So this is a tensor product, right? A tensor product just stay, keeps all the probabilities for both of them. But now what if uh, these numbers were different? These numbers were, let's say 51, 26 and 23. Well, then there's no way that I can write those as a tensor product. There's no way that I can find numbers that when I multiply them the way they are at the left, I get 51, 26, and 23. So that means these are entangled. So I way to check is if the product of these two is equal to the product of those two, they're not entangled. And if the product is different, then they, they got to be entangled because I don't have independent probabilities for, for happy sad. And so the same thing happens with qubits. Basically, I think of the tensor product. And if I can write the tensor product, if I can write the, the, the states of those two qubits as a product of an independent one for the first one and the second one, then they're not entangled. And if I cannot, that means that they are entangled. Uh, and I think here I'm just repeating what I just said. So I'm going to go a little faster. When I cannot write as a tensor product, that means they're entangled. So in, let's, go to, let's go to entangling gates because then I will be able 
to have qubits that are not entangled and I will be able to entangle. So I have, uh, in a classical land, I have classical gates that are and and or, and they are, as you've seen them before, this is the AND gate, which gives me a one if, if both of the qubits are, if, of the bits are one. And an OR gate, which gives me a one if either one of the bits is, is a one. Now there's, uh, in, in quantum computing, we're not gonna have this because you cannot lose qubits. You always have to start end with the same number of qubits that you started. So you're not gonna have an OR gate where you have two and one comes out or you cannot duplicate qubits. You just, you always have to have the same amount of qubits. And we have the C naught gate. So who can help me out to figure out what the C naught gate does? Can somebody suggest what it does based on this? Christopher flips says it the state of, flips the state of control state when the controller state is one. Exactly, it's a control state, right? So if the first is up, you do nothing. And if the first is down, you flip the second one. So this is what it does. That's the C not gate, uh, control not, and this is the matrix for it. So now uh, we have the bell states. If you remember, they are the fully entangled. It's either up, up, and down, down, superposition, or up, down, down, up. And so if you go to the the, the link for the labs, you'll see that the second exercise is, is trying to find the quantum circuit for entangling two qubits. So can you use these gates, put them together, and, and make a circuit that entangles the two qubits that you start with up, up, and it gives you a superposition of up, up, and down, down. So let me tell you how to do it. A way to do this is using a Hadamard and a C naught, because when you use the Hadamard, what it does, it rotates it like this, giving you this state, right? Now the first one is superposition and the second one is pure. I take the tensor product, and now I apply the C naught, which does precisely flips the third and the fourth and it entangles them. And then we're done. So this is how you entangle two qubits, right? So see, notice that for entangling one qubit, all I need is the Hadamard gate. For entangling two qubits, I need the Hadamard and the C naught. Thank you so much, Claudia, for posting the link to the, to the lab and the, in, the, in the chat. So let me give you a bit of, a, of an idea of what's coming. The idea is that we're going to prepare quantum circuits for things, right? So we prepare the quantum circuit for entangling two qubits. When you have a lot more qubits, it's hard to prepare a quantum circuit. So for that, we use machine learning. There are some uh, icing coupling gates, which what they do is basically they entangle two qubits for free. So they, they just kind of like in, in one operation, they entangle the, the two qubits. And the way I like to see them is imagine the, the gate that does nothing and the gate that fully flips your two qubits. Well, something in between will, will keep you in between the up, up and the down, down, right? So it's almost like here's your matrix that does nothing. Here's your matrix that entangles everything. And it's something that would look like this. So it's a matrix with cosines and sines that if you plug in a zero, it does nothing. If you plug in a pi, it, it pi over two flips everything. And if you plug in anything in between, it, it keeps you in between. Uh, and so finally, we get to the meat of, of today's topic, which is what is a quantum circuit born machine? So in the labs, lab number three uh, asks you to create a more complicated Bell state. So check, check this out. Uh, Basically, if you have, let's say you have four qubits, right? And each qubit can be up or down. So you have 16 possibilities, right? You have two to the uh, four, which is 16. And so every, every combination of four qubits is gonna be putting some numbers here such that the squares add to one. So I'm gonna save space and just tell you which ones are non-zero, right? So every Every combination of four qubits looks like this. And so if you're gonna create a Bell state, uh, if you wanna create the superposition is very easy. You use a Hadamard gate. If you're gonna create the Bell state, uh, it's kind of hard because you have to use the Hadamard and the C naught. What if I gave you three qubits 
and I told you to create the Bell state equivalent for me to put qubits to, to put gates together so that you end up with half of up, 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 and half of down, down, down. So that is much harder. And for four, it's a lot harder. So we're not going to do it manually. Instead, we're going to use machine learning. So we're going to use what's called a QCBM. Uh, let me remind you uh, that you can do a, you can entangle two qubits like this, or you can entangle two qubits, sorry, there's an extra little dot there, uh, using a Y gate, which basically what you do is you will start with zero, zero, and you want to end up with half zero, half one. So you basically can play with that angle as much as you want until you get what you want it, right? The same thing with two, you have a Y, y gate and you start with zero, zero, you finish with what you want, which is half zero, zero, half one, one. And you know, any, any angle theta gives you something. And so you play with this angle until you get what you want. There's a question by Daniel said by harder. Are you saying there is no known algorithm for generating the circuit? No, there. Um, I think you'll see. There's there's no no known algorithm uh, that I know of. But there is the technique that I'm going to show you uses machine learning to sort of find that circuit. So it's it's hard to find come up with a general way of doing it. But I'll show you a way that uses machine learning to solve this. Okay. So for three qubits, one thing I could do is put in YY gates everywhere. And I want to start with 0, 0, 0 and end up with half 0, 0, 0, half 1, 1, 1. And so I play with these angles as much as I want. But now, as you can see, every time there's more angles to play with and every time there's a bigger space to look for, for solutions, so it gets harder and, and harder. And that's when we use a quantum circuit born machine. So here's an example of a quantum circuit born machine, right? Let's say I have four qubits and I'm going to have a bunch of Y gates, a bunch of Z gates, and a bunch of YY gates, and a bunch of observation gates. And these all have some angle theta. And I don't know what the perfect angle theta is. It's a parameter, right? So given this, I'm going to apply the angle, the rotation. Then I'm going to apply other rotations. Then I'm going to start entangling my qubits, rotating and entangling. And then I'm going to observe them. So observe them means they go up or down with some probability. And I'm going to say that I started with zero, 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 which is up, 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 and I finished with up, down, down, up. So basically I have this. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to send my zero, 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 many, 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 many times and see what I'm getting, what distribution I'm getting. Because if I wanted to get this, let's say that I wanted to train a circuit to get these numbers over here, well, those numbers have this bar chart over here, right? And what I would do is I play with my circuit once and I get, let's say, down, up, down, up. And so I record it. I run it again and I get up, down, up, up. So I record that and I do this thousands of times and I get this bar chart. And so that's, I assume that that is the qubit that I, the, 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 the superposition state that I ended with. Maybe it's not, but after many, many tries, I get something very similar to what I to, to the actual um, the actual wave uh, function that I had at the beginning. Because I cannot tell what this wave function is. I can only measure it many times. And so, for example, if I wanted to create a circuit that I start with one, 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 and I end up with a superposition of sorry, that I started with, with up, 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 and I end up with a superposition of up, 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 and down, 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 then what I want is something that if I measure many times, I will get half of the time roughly the zero, 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 and half of the time the one, 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 one. 
Humberto says, would that be just like a sample as in a survey? Yes, exactly. So if I run my circuit, I will not be able to read what the wave function is. So all I can do is I run that circuit many times. I check how many times I got each one of the, of the let's say two to the four combinations. And I just assume that the wave function that I have has those, those numbers because that's all I can do. So here's how I train it. Let's say that I wanna find the circuit that gives me a superposition of up, 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 and down, 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 down. Well, I start with some circuit that gives me something, right? It's not what I wanted, but it's something. And I compare it with the one that I want. So this is pure machine learning uh, uh, logic, right? I compare it with what I want, which is the target. Uh, I compare it in some way. I'll show you how to compare it. And then I go back to my circuit and I said, you know what? Update this angles so that you get closer to what I wanted. And then you update the angles and get something maybe closer. And then you compare it again. You update the angles. Maybe you get a little closer and you do this hundreds of times until you get to closer to what you want. This is how machine learning works, right? You, you see what you got. If it's not what you wanted, you move a little closer and you move a little closer and you move a little closer until eventually you're gonna end up with the angles that you wanted. So that's pretty much it, right? You end up with the correct parameters that you wanted to end up with. So that you start with some random parameters and eventually you get to some perfect numbers that give you what you wanted. Uh, is there any questions about that? That's pretty much how, uh, that's pretty much how uh, uh, a QCBM works. Um, how much time do I do I have uh, to see how much I can how much else I can fit? You have uh, over fifteen minutes. You can ask some questions. Oh, I have a lot of time. Okay, yeah, you have a lot of time. Great. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll, I guess I'll stop to see if there's any questions. But it's pretty you know it's pretty much exactly what machine learning does, right? Like see what you got, get closer and closer and closer. Um, Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and answer some questions. Chirac says, "How does the QCBM translate into quantum generative model?" Well, that's a great question. This is exactly quantum generative model, right? It's just that I'm only generating four things. Actually, I think my next example is gonna help you with your with your question. So give it a give it a second. Sergio says, "How do you decide which gates to put in the circuit?" Excellent question. Uh, there are some given architectures. Uh, this is the one that that I showed you, but in reality, the one that I use the most in practice is the complete one. So I connect the first and the second qubits, the first and the third, first and fourth, second and third, second and fourth, third and fourth. So all the possible combinations. Of course, this is harder to create in a NISC device, right? But in some of them, but you can pick any architecture in the same way as in neural networks, right? Where you pick the architecture and then train it. Here you pick the architecture and then, and then train it, but there's some standard ones. Uh, how do you decide which uh, one else says in the hybrid classical of quantum machine learning, what advantage does quantum bring onto it? Great question. Um, we believe that quantum, and there's reasons to believe this, but quantum circuits can kind of search the space better than the classical circuits. And we've been, been seeing on the practice that classical circuits have a lot of limitations in, in how they explore a space. Uh, the way I look at it is, I mean, quantum quantum circuits are like random generators, whereas a classical neural network is not so good at generating random stuff. You have to come up with the random numbers and plug them in. Um, so it's just, yeah, there's there's many reasons why why it's believed that they are good at generating stuff, or at least they generate different things, which adds an extra, adds some information. Uh, Arthur says, how do you define with direction to adjust the parameters? I'm coming to that question pretty soon. So just wait like five minutes. How much time do you have in quantum realm? I'm not sure if I understand that question, Jigger. Is it is it like me or or in or in general? Uh, anyway, feel free to ask it again. Chirag says, is QML only useful for quantum data? No, QML is useful for classical data because you can input your classical data into the circuit and, and, and then 
plug in zeros and then you have your embedding and then you can measure to get classical data. So you can start with classical, end with classical and have quantum in between. Uh, someone says, will the presentation slides be posted somewhere? We'll definitely have a YouTube video of this. And I'll let uh, the Yes, we will send out the presentation slides in an email to all of the attendees and we'll also send out the YouTube video Perfect. within a few days. Sounds good. Krishna says, so if I have four data variables in my data set and I want to generate new data, then I need to convert those variables into qubits and then use ML to generate new data. Yes, you can have, you can turn your data into qubits or you can also turn your data into angles and then measure qubits and, 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 then, and then plug in qubits and then you get a representation of your data. I'm gonna skip some of the questions and I'm gonna go ahead and continue and then I'll go back to these questions so I can make sure I, I get to where I wanna get. Uh, if you go to the, that he, here's, here's the answer to the question, how do you generate data with this? So of course we don't have enough computers big enough, quantum computers big enough to fit in the, the image of a face, but I'm gonna pick a much smaller data set, which is the bars and stripes data set. Have you ever seen the bars and stripes data set? It's just rectangles where you have either a bunch of bars or a bunch of stripes. And so here is the entire uh, three, three bars and stripes. You can have all of them and none of them as well. How do you encode them? Well, with ones and zeros. So here's how I encode a bars and stripes element, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. That's just a, 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 a combination of qubits, right? So I can encode my data set into qubits. Now I'm gonna try to model that. So here is just, just for fun. This is the two by two uh, data set. Uh, this is the entire uh, set of of uh, four qubits, of combinations of four qubits. And I'm gonna erase the ones that are not bars and stripes and I only get six bars and stripes. And so we have this distribution basically, only bars and stripes are one sixth probability and then the rest are zero. So this is my, this is my wave equation, my wave function. And uh, I get this. And so I can train a QCBM to generate bars and stripes. And in the lab, in the link that I gave you for the lab, uh, you can see how to do this in, in PyCool. So I encourage you to go check it out and start generating bars and stripes. Uh, so as I said, the training process, you start with some angles and those angles give you something that obviously is not bars and stripes, right? With the high probability. And you end up with bars and stripes. So I'm gonna tell you several things. The first one is how to compare, which is the loss function. So remember this picture where the yellow uh, arrow on the right says, compare the distribution that you got with the distribution that you wanted to get. How do you compare it? There's many ways to do it. KL divergence, log likelihood, maximum mean discrepancy, you name it. I'm gonna show you KL divergence very quickly. If I have a probability distribution P and a probability distribution Q, and they look very similar, then the KL divergence is tiny. If I have two that look very different, then the KL divergence is large. And there's an easy formula to do this, summation of P of X, log of P of X over Q of X. This comes out of probability. This comes out of, of um, uh, cross entropy, et cetera. But the fact is this magical number is big when the probabilities distributions are different and small when they're, when they're similar. So that's the, the function that you wanna minimize. And how do you minimize the function? So now let's talk about how to update the angles. That was a question that I saw in the chat, right? Like how do I know in what direction I'm gonna move my angles and walk around in the space to find the perfect angles? So there's two ways, there's many. But uh, one is particle swarm optimization and the other one is CMAES. Uh, if, you, if you're used to machine learning, you may be used to uh, gradient based, right? To doing gradient descent where I can just take a, a tangent and walk in the direction of the tangent and, and, and minimize my function. That is doable. That is doable in machine learning in, in quantum machine learning. Uh, and all you have to do, just imagine you have a bunch of cosines and sines the derivatives are gonna be cos and sine science as well. So you just, you just calculate your derivatives and play with that. But we're not gonna do it. We're gonna do it gradient free. So I'm gonna show you how to minimize functions without taking derivatives. And the idea of that is uh, 
let's say that I want to minimize this function. And so I'm just going to hire a bunch of my friends. This is the minimal point, right? I'm just going to hire a bunch of my friends. And together, we're going to walk the space and try to find the minimum. So let me show you. This is from the top. So black is the minimum point. Uh, red is medium. And yellow and white are the highest points. So I want to find this point over here. So how do I do it? I have five of my friends. And we're going to walk around. And this is actually inspired on, I think, bees. Bees tend to operate this way when they want to try to find the, the most amount of nectar uh, by flying together. Uh, and so I'm going to tell you three strategies to find the black, the, the lowest spot. And the three strategies are really dumb, but when you combine them, they're, they're a genius strategy, okay? So the first strategy is inertia. The second one is personal best. And the third one is team best. So imagine that we're walking around the space. There's like four of you and me. And we're walking around the space. And at some point we say, okay, let's 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 look at what direction we're going. And let's continue pointing in that direction and continue walking in that direction until we're out of the space. So we all did this. And then we say, okay, now let's see where what is the best point that we found? And it's this one. So that's strategy one. It's, it's continue walking in your direction and do nothing else. It's not a genius strategy. Uh, strategy two is personal best. So let's say we're walking around and we remember, we remember what was the best I've ever done. So the lowest point I ever found in this function. And let's say that for the first point is this, for the second point is this, for the third is this, for the fourth is this, and for the fifth is this. So it makes sense to think, well, I'm going to walk towards the point where I remember doing the best. So we all point towards our personal best. And then we all walk towards our personal best. And that's it. So we look at what point we found that was the, the lowest point. So that's an okay strategy, but it's still not ideal, right? And the third one is team best, which is we talk among each other. And we say, what is the best that one of us has been able to find in, in their journey? And let's say that, you know, one of us managed to find this lowest point over here one at some point. So we all point to that direction. We all walk towards that direction. And then we see what was the best we got. So those strategies are okay, but what if we put them all together? So what I'm going to do is let's say that I'm the point on the top left. I'm going to take one step in the inertia strategy. So one step in the direction that I was already going. I'm going to take one step towards my personal best. And I'm going to take one step towards the team best. So I take one step in each one of the directions, which if you're used to vector addition, it's vector addition. And then we all do that every time. And so the, the maximum gets, gets moved around and stuff. So you, know, you can imagine that doing this in real time kind of walks you towards the best point eventually, right? And so with very, very high probability, you end up at something pretty good. So that's particle swarm optimization. Since we have a couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you also how CMAES works. Uh, feel free to stop me if there's, if there's any questions. Uh, I'm going to show you another algorithm. This one is not about particles flying around, but this one is more of a genetic algorithm. It's called CMAES, Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolution Strategy. So it's an evolutionary algorithm. And check out how it works. I want to find this point, which is the minimal point of the function. So I'm going to put five random points. Okay. And in a nutshell, I'm going to make these points reproduce and the weakest will die, and then the strongest reproduce, and then the weakest die, and then the strongest reproduce, and then the weakest die until, until we get an amazing race of points uh, through evolution. Um, so what I'm going to use for them to reproduce is a Gaussian curve, a Gaussian, Gaussian a paraboloid, uh, which looks exactly like a bump in three dimensions or in as many dimensions as you are. I'm going to look at it from the top. So from the top, all I see is that thing on the bottom. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my five points. 
I'm going to let the weakest of them die. And the weakest are the ones that are at the highest points because I want to find the lowest point in the function, right? So only the three that are at the most bottom survive. And now out of these three, I'm going to find a Gaussian that, that, that uh, passes through them, like the Gaussian distribution of these three of them, right? Think of a bump that goes towards you. Now these, these die because then this generation dies and then five new are born using this Gaussian distribution. So these new ones are born. And then again, I only the, only the three strongest survive. And then I fit a Gaussian to these three points. Then they die. Then five new are born. Then the three strongest survive. Then I fit a Gaussian because they reproduce, they die. Five new ones are born. Then the three strongest survive and so on. So you can see how this strategy is always getting me smaller and smaller and smaller values for the function with high probability, right? And so one day I get to where I want it. And so that's pretty much it. So let me summarize what happened, right? We have a parameterized quantum circuit. So we have a quantum circuit with a bunch of angles that we don't know what they are. We want to fit a distribution that we want. So we want to, 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 uh, to generate a particular data set. And so what we do is we have a cost function that could be KL divergence, or in this case, I, I just wrote uh, a log likelihood, uh, anything. You have an optimizer, which can be particle strong optimization. It can be gradient based. It can be CMAES, it can be anything you want. And you use that repeatedly to improve your angles, improve your angles, improve your angles until one day you get the perfect angles that fit your distribution beautifully, or at least the closest you can. Uh, to give you an idea of the labs, these are the winning angles for, um, I believe for bars and stripes. And with the, with the all to all connections, which is the best one, you, these are the winning angles. Uh, and yeah, feel free to try the lab on PyQuill, which has this algorithm. You can there's uh, you can play with it and see the play with the error functions, play with the training, etc. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So many applications we can have. Uh, I'll skip these things. And if you want to know more, yeah, check out check out this this demo. I'll put it in the I'll put it in the in the chat, but there is a demo, an orchestra, which the link is here. If you want to point your phone at the screen, uh, I, I give that demo so you can uh, you can take a look. And it's with with the platform uh, called Orchestra that that we have at Zapata that um, does this in a in an actual quantum computer because the lab that I gave you does it in a simulator, right? This one you can run in an actual quantum computer. And that's pretty much it. So before I go to questions, before I start answering questions, uh, somebody's asking me the right, the right question, which is uh, how do I go for learning more things? So go to go to orchestra.io. That's our webpage where we have a bunch of tutorials. There'll be more tutorials coming. This, this material may be there at some point. Um, and uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, I'll leave this here if you want. There's... Uh, a discount code for my machine learning book. This is classical machine learning. The discount code is Serrano PC, and here's the the web page to buy. It. It's, it's Manning.com. If you're interesting, the book is called Grokking Machine Learning. Uh, I have this YouTube channel. If you're interested in seeing more material uh, on machine learning, this is my Twitter, and this is my page where all the information is there. Serrano.academy. So I'll leave this here. And I'll go ahead and answer questions uh, from the chat. So throw in your questions, and I'll and I'll go for them. Do you want to say some words in the meantime, or oh, okay? No, you're good. I think I finished you're that at seventy-nine. Yeah. Okay, I just saw your camera, and I thought maybe. You're <laughs> okay, cool. So I will, I will answer questions, and I think. Uh, 
Yeah, let me go for this one again that I answered it kind of quickly. Krishna says, so if I have four data variables and I want to generate new data, then I convert those variables into qubits. So yes, as I said, two ways. You can convert the variables into qubits or you can turn the variables into angles and then put qubits through. And what you get is an embedding of your data, right? Uh, Christopher says, does the noise error cancel out or do you deal with the error during QGAN? Is this error distribution skewed? That's a good question. See, with GANs, we don't care so much about error because you're generating a bunch of random stuff. There are other algorithms where you really care about the error more because you want a number or something, even discriminative algorithms. Um, yeah, for yeah, for, for for the general models that we've been working, they're they're small because as I said, you're not gonna you're not gonna fit in the entire image on a quantum computer, right? What you normally do is you take your big image and you use a neural network to crunch it down to a small thing, to a small number of, of uh, bits. And then in those bits, you fit in a quantum, uh, uh, quantum uh, generator to learn that distribution. And we've noticed that that improves the, the generator a lot. And then what you have from there, you blow it up again with, a, with another neural network, right? So you use, you use quantum as a little piece of the equation and we've noticed um, improvements from there. Um, Kushal says, what type of embedding is best used to encode the classical data into the quantum circuit? Yeah, as I mentioned, you, 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 your data becomes angles and then you, and then you, you throw in quantum in qubits and that's sort of the most common embedding right now. Chirac says, at the moment, what requires less computer power, running QML on classical data or quantum data? Um, well, I guess this is, we really are running it on classical data, but the way we encode the classical data here is by letting, since we have bit strings, ones and zeros, then we easily encode them into qubits one and zero. So it's kind of like, it is classical data and we're encoding it as qubits. So I don't really know what it means, what, how would QML run on quantum data? There are, there are quantum generators nervous that run on quantum data, but I'm not, I'm not sure how they work. Uh, community says, make sure to check out the Discord channel. So do do check out the Discord the Discord channel. Uh, Chirac says, are there any real world applications of quantum general models in the near future, considering the quantum computer resources needed to execute execute them? They, we have seen some improvements. As I said, we have we have seen improvements on classical general models by quantum uh, by sticking a quantum general model in between. Uh, nothing as I mean, yeah, we don't have enough qubits to generate a, a ton of stuff. So, but as devices get bigger and bigger, I, I do believe we'll be able to, to start generating interesting things in the near future. Uh, other things that happen, I mean, you, you'll be surprised, but you don't just generate like images, like you can generate things like solutions to problems. Like if you're solving problems in, in any field in optimization or something and you find your solutions with classical algorithms and you use a general model to, to generate more of those. You can do that, right? So it's a lot of applications uh, right now. Uh, let's see, let's see. Yash says, is this similar to quantum approximate optimization problems? Yes, uh, quantum, if you're talking about like things like QAOA or VQE, they, what they normally do is they uh, minimize they, they find the minimum of a function, right? They wanna find the minimum energy of a system or the minimum eigenvalue or something. This is finding the minimum of a KL divergence. So it's, it, is, it is similar to, to minimizing a function, right? Christopher, that sounds like particle filters. Yes, very, very much like, like particle filters. Uh, right, he's asking me, what are suggestions to study uh, for beginners in QML? That's a great question. Uh, I'll, uh, there's a few courses that I like. Maybe I'll, I'll finish the questions and then I'll switch my screen to, to show you some courses. Um, 
Daniel says, since you typically use a fixed circuit pattern and optimize over angle parameters, has any work been done into how different quantum computer architectures affects the performance of a QCBM? Great question, yes. Um, yeah, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. Where am I here? Hi. Um, for example, this architecture, uh, these architectures are hard on some NISC devices because it's hard to plug in quantum z qubit zero to qubit three, right? So one that is actually better, for example, this one is easier, right? Like if you have this thing over here, see this one's easier for some NISC devices because you don't have to, um, because some of them, uh, the qubits are, are organized in a certain way that they're harder to, to, to connect if they're far away. So yes, architectures do differ depending on what device you're using and algorithms do have different uh, performances on, on different computers. So that's something to, to always have in mind. Claudia says, is the same if we use YY or XX? Actually, yeah, good question. Uh, I think I cheated because I used YY and then I said XX so that, <laughs> That shows that no, there's no difference. Uh, there are some combinations of angles that don't work, but as long as you're exploring the space, uh, XX, XX works well. Uh, yeah, I would, I would use them either way. Alexandra says, resources or papers to learn and get in depth? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hold that question and tell you in a little bit. But yes, there are good resources. Uh, Umberto says, Zapata recently published an internship opportunity for undergraduates. Absolutely. Please check out our webpage. Uh, I'll, I'll show it to you in a second for, for, a, for opportunities. We are very happy for it. With, uh, we'll have, we have some great, great interns. Uh, internships are, are fun and they have, you get to do research and uh, I highly recommend it. Uh, Sergio says, can anyone send a link to the tutorial? And Claudia kindly sent the link. So thank you very much. Peter says, I knew nothing before this and an application developer in Java, and now you have an understanding. Thank you, very happy to hear. Uh, copy of the slides, yes, uh, will, slides and video will be available. Thank you, Yevonael says, thank you, I was gonna study more. And uh, Sergio says, is there a proven advantage of QML over classical ML? Unfortunately, we don't, that would be quantum supremacy. So we don't have that, but we do have a bunch of small examples where we've seen that it improves over over the the classical case there's images that we generate that we see an improvement there are solutions to optimization problems so there, there have we have seen improvements and we expect to see much more improvements later Tanmoy says should i learn classical ml before starting learning qml i would just learn in both at the same time there start learning quantum computing and machine learning at the same time and you'll, you'll see how they sort of merge together uh, Jigger says, I'm assuming quantum computing will improve performance from Monte Carlo simulations and mean variance portfolio optimizations in mathematical finance. I wonder how much it improves performance for finding more viable solutions. Um, yes, you should check out a paper. Um, I don't have the link yet, but there, check out for, you know, enhanced optimization quantum computing because there you can use the quantum computer to generate new solutions to your, to your problems and then test them in the classical way. So this is definitely possible. Chirac says, does QML offer speed ups, better accuracy or both? Um, I would say, yeah, both, both things. In generative models, it's hard to talk about accuracy, but you can talk about other metrics like uh, inception score or things like that. So you do get better in that. Uh, speed ups, yeah, I guess I haven't ever measured speed ups, but I would say that if not now, later, Definitely, there will be speed ups. Uh, and to your access, can you please share resources, courses for QML? So that question is common. So I'm going to go ahead and give you some resources. Um, well, here, first of all, Orchestra IO Docs is, is very good tutorials. Here you have tutorials, although they're mostly for, for package. A, a course that I really like on quantum machine learning, sorry, on quantum computing is by Umesh Vasirani. 
he has a great took took a great course on YouTube. So I, I highly recommend it. This is how I kind of learned quantum computing. It's an entire list. So just search for Umesh Vasirani quantum computing. And then when it comes to quantum machine learning, there's a course by Peter Wittek. That is fantastic. So check, check this out. Uh, quantum machine learning. So I, it's also a playlist. So I, I highly recommend her, recommend them both, both on YouTube. Um, books, there's this one by Shane Wilson, quantum computing. So this is a book that, that I use and it's very good by Isaac Chuang and Michael Nielsen. Uh, and uh, yeah, what else? What else can I give you? I mean, if you want to learn classical machine learning, then let me toot my own horn. And uh, my page, I have a bunch of videos. So I have videos on general machine learning, uh, etc. I also have them in the YouTube channel. So feel free to, would love it if, if you subscribe and see a lot of, uh, a lot of videos on generative models uh this this type of stuff neural networks etc so highly recommend it um if you're interested in deep learning there's a course that i teach on on udacity where i used to work for free no not i didn't work for free but the course is free uh and it's on uh, intro to deep learning with pytorch so if you're interested in machine learning that i uh i recommend it as well i taught it with a few other people and it has labs in PyTorch. Um, is it possible for me to like just copy paste all these resources and they get sent to people? Yeah, so all of these links and then your Twitter, your YouTube and your website, we will just send them out in an email and also put them in the description of the YouTube video. So everyone should be able to find them. Wonderful. So yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much all I got. Let me see more answer, more questions here. Uh, Christopher has shared a table of speed ups. Thank you very much. Check it out, everybody. Yuhendra says, are there GPU simulations for QML? Uh, there are GPU, there's definitely simulations for QML. Uh, there probably are, but I'm not aware. But check, check, check this page, Orchestra IO for GPU simulations. There's yeah, definitely what what we do is simulations, right? Like these, these labs that I'm showing you with the, this is the lab where the bars and stripes and, and you see the training happening with the error function and stuff. This is purely simulation. This, this does not run on a quantum computer, right? Um, so I encourage you to, to take a look at this. Uh, let's see, is there a difference between using IBM Qiskit and the tutorials link you shared? Uh, there's a bunch of different packages. There's um, Qiskit, PyQuil, um, all kinds of stuff. Hey, you know where else there's good tutorials? Penny Lane has Penny Lane. Penny Lane has good tutorials. Uh, you go to play. Um, I would say that the difference between using this is the same difference as if you're using different packages in a classical computer. So you can use PyTorch or TensorFlow or NumPy. Like it's it's kind of like that. Um, different packages, different different architectures, different different computers, uh, different different quantum uh, computers. You know, it's the, it's the same thing. But I would, if I'm if you're gonna get started in QML, I would say just just pick one package and learn it. This kit is pretty good. Pyco is pretty good. You know. Uh, let's see. I have a message in Spanish from Alexander. Hola. I don't know if any resources in Spanish, unfortunately. Maybe I'll make some in the future. And oh, and there's also some tutorials in community. So let me let me click on the oh, this is nice. Look at that. Oh, this is lovely. I had no idea. Variational quantum against silver, etc. So definitely check out the tutorials at community. Let me see. Any more questions? I feel like we've answered all of them. 
Or if I miss something, feel free to ask it again, because I, I know I scroll down pretty quickly sometimes. Yeah, um, well, thank you everyone for coming and Luis for speaking. We will be sending all of those links. So you see his book, his YouTube, his Twitter, and his, his website. All of those will be sent out in an email along with the recording and the slides as well. And we really appreciate you coming and everyone who tuned in to listen. Very exciting. Yeah, any last words you want to say? Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. You guys are a wonderful group. This is a wonderful uh, crowd, which uh, answered all my questions and asked some some great questions. So I I learned. So so thank you very much. Continue continue learning. Continue being hungry for knowledge. And uh, see you in the future. <laughs> Hopefully yes. one day we can do this in person. <laughs> yeah. In the when when all this ends. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, everyone. Have a great have night. A great night. Thank you.